Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. This is the 10th of February. Tonight, we're going to have Fred Dupre tying some, some, uh, some of his favorite patterns, and we'll expand on the weekly tip a little more in the area of Zoom equipment. Greetings, we're the Beatties from Boise, Idaho. Fred Dupre is a retired telephone company employee who has been tying flies for the past 62 years. He has been recognized for his skill at the Fly Tying Vice with the Buzz Busick Award, Dick Nelson Fly Tying Teaching Award, and has earned the Bronze, Silver, and Gold Fly Tying Skill Awards. Fred is also one of the few people who is an evaluator for all three skill awards levels. He is a longtime tying teacher and demonstrator with a string of expos, shows, and conclaves to his credit. He is currently the treasurer for the FFI Fly Tying Group and is on their executive board. Join us in welcoming Fred to Fly Tying Friday. And Fred, you can go for it. Good. Thanks for having me back, Al. I didn't yep. know if you if I did poorly last time. You'd invite me back. So <laughs> thanks for inviting me back. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about... Uh, uh, two flies, and uh, the first fly is going to be a sexy shad baby fat minnow. This this fly this fly uses a hook foot full and mill. It's a carp hook. Uh, I've I bought I bought a bunch of them, and I really don't like them. And so I'm substituting tonight one of my old standby hooks, a uh, good bass hook I've used it for years. It's a Mustad 3366 um, using white uh, 70 denier thread, uh, a tungsten bead. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use silver. Uh, the collar is going to be a Calabatus ice dub. Tail is going to be three levels, uh, yellow, or actually, it's not yellow, it's, it's chartreuse, <clears throat> uh, pearl gray, and blue stacked one on top of another. And then the head is gonna be a combination of uh, Bruiser Blend Junior Dub, gray holographic and cream, and one eighth inch eyes. This is what the fly looks like uh, before I dip it in water. Okay? Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> and I wanna show you what the fly looks like afterwards and that's, what you see now, and it's uh, if you think about shad, shad uh, in a lot of cases are almost translucent, and um, and so the materials on this fly are chosen to create that translucence. Um, also, it has a shad has, believe it or not, if you look at it real close, has a lot of different colors in it. It has sort of a, a yellowish throat, and I put some red uh, gills, and uh, the eyes are rather big on the shed, so that's what you see, and there's a black dot. So let me start. So I got a 3366 size four hook, and a, uh, and a bead, a tungsten bead. First thing I'm gonna do is uh, secure this bead, And I'm gonna wrap back to a point that is gonna allow my eye to sit there in between the bead and the hook eye. So when I apply the eye as the last step, it will sit right there. So I'm just wrapping it around the bead to secure it. And I'm wrapping back down to the hook bend. Moving the tag. Okay, the tail is in three layers. Um, first layer is uh, chartreuse marabou. And you wanna find chartreuse marabou that's nice and wispy like this. Here's another piece that's probably better. Nice and wispy. 
So you have to peel back all the, the base fibers. You want the tail to be about twice the length of the body. And so I'm going to tie that in. And tie the chartreuse in. Remove the waist. Next color, marabou, is gray. For those of you who live on the White River, because there's a few of you on tonight in that area, this is a great fly for when they're pulsing shad through the dam and the shad run. Put some hairline ice dub calabatus. What I do is I clip the corner of the package and I pull the material out there so that way I don't have to open the bag. Also I use this tool a lot. It's sort of like a dental pick and it picks out a whole bunch of stuff and it's uh, great for pulling out dubbing and all kinds of things. Yeah, I'm a Dub my thread. And we're going to wrap this this point. And the next, uh, we're going to put a, what I call a veil of calibatus dubbing around the whole fly in the rear. So we'll pull out an ample amount of Calus betas, cal betas dubbing. And I'm going to take that material and I'm going to align the fibers by pulling them and stacking them right on top of one another. And I'm going to take it and uh, open it up. I'm going to wet these. Uh, pieces of marabou to get my way. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to encircle the hook shank and then come back around here and tie it in and then pull it back. And that's the rear part of the body. Front part of the body is going to be made up of uh, Bruiser Blend Junior Dub, gray, hollow, holographic, and uh, green cream. The first part is going to be the the gray holographic material, and I'm going to again pull out. A piece and then start stacking it. And I don't have enough, so I'm going to grab some more. Okay, keep it aligned the fibers by pulling and restacking. And then I'm going to take and kind of Push all the fibers together and pull my thread right behind the hook eye. And then I'm going to tie this on top of the hook shank. Just two wraps. And then I'm going to take the uh, cream 
junior blend. Do the same thing on the bottom. Make sure your cream is on the bottom and your gray's on top. And at this point, I'm going to sort of fan out the, the top part, the gray, and I'm going to push it back over the top. And I'm going to take one wrap to secure it on top. And then you tie back I use a little comb like this to kind of comb out the the material and the next step um you tend to get a lot of frayed fibers around that that hook. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a cigarette lighter and just just hit it to where it it fries all the the uh, loose fibers. Loctite super glue gel version. Lay it on the side and just put a very small amount. Because these eyes are going to be held down predominantly by uh, UV resin eventually. So I'm going to take my eyes. Okay, one set of eyes. Do the next set. And the next step is to uh, further secure these eyes. I use solar res and I use thick and hard. It builds up a head pretty quick. And I'm gonna hit that with the torch. And those are dried. Next, I'm gonna do a little coloring on the fly with some magic markers. And uh, first color I'm gonna use is a just a brown. Most fish on top have a dark stripe. Well, let me just wet this thing down and you see what it looks like. But you can see the translucence of this fly. And uh, I think, you know, this is a shad pattern. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but if you think about it, you can tie most mental patterns using this technique. Um, uh, I know in Louisiana, where I'm from, we use in the, in the Gulf cockaho minnows. And uh, you can, uh, and they're about the same shape as this pattern. So you could uh, get yourself a pattern, uh, 
a picture of a cacajo minnow and 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 with your magic markers you dress it up so his next pattern is a, a chewy's minnow it's a redfish fly and um using a gamagatsu sl 11 3h size 6 <clears throat> or you can use a mustad um 34006 i believe it is in size 6 and tonight i'm going to use a mustad hook um and then i'm going to put use a a unique bead that just came out in the market a few months ago it's an Umqua bead bomb, uh, 2.5 millimeter threaded on the hook shank using 16 pound mono. And uh, that bead actually uh, keels the flyover where it rides hook point up using a 140 denier chartreuse thread, pearl mylar cord for tail. The body is going to be flat diamond braid pearl. The wing uh, is going to be Arctic Fox, Crystal Flash with some char chartreuse fish hair. And then the head is going to be uh, chartreuse deer hair stacked for the collar. Wrap the hook shank with your thread for a base all the way down. And then remove the tag. I use hard mason. You can just use regular mono. It's a 16 pound hard mason. And we'll take a little section of that hard mason. And I'm going to flatten the tip of it. I'm going to tie it in right there. And the next thing is that I'm going to put my bead on. I can find my bead. It's buried around here. And here's the beads. They're uh, fulling mill uh, tungsten drop beads. The difference here is the hole for these beads um, is at the bottom of the bead, not through the center. You can use this bead, by the way, to take any hook and turn it into a jig style fly. So. Mm -hmm. Darn. Here it is. Here's the bead. And I'm gonna secure it down the other side. And then wrap in front, go around it, tighten it down. And then remove the excess mono. Again, this bead will keel this fly over so it rides hook point up. Also, this fly, the way it was designed, in Texas at least, uh, we fish very shallow water for, and I'm talking about shallow, uh, ankle deep, calf deep water uh, for redfish in, in the flats, in the bays and estuaries. And on the bottom, uh, is uh, a lot of grass. So if you throw a crazy Charlie or a Clouser minnow or anything else out there, it generally falls down into the grass. And when you start to retrieve, you start pulling grass back with you. As we all know, fish are not gonna attack a fly that's dragging a whole bunch of grass. Uh, this fly, um, Due to the, the, the construction of it, design of it, it it almost is neutral buoyant. It rides about two to three inches below the surface, and it uh, when you fish it, 
and you uh, you you jerk it, and it actually it goes back and forth, like let me see, back and forth like this, and uh, which turns the fish on. So, so the tail, basically, it is the uh, pearl mylar cord. So I'm gonna cut off a little piece and then I'm gonna pull the cord out, leaving only the mylar. And then I'm gonna tie that in. Next, I'm gonna use some flat diamond braid, pearl for the body. Tie it off and remove the waste. Next, we're going to be putting in Arctic Fox. I love this stuff. It uh, it's almost like hairy marabou, and uh, it it flows through the water. Uh, it's uh, it sheds water real well, um, and I just love using this stuff so you know i've tied this backwards Bear with me a second. I got to correct something. Now I'm going to turn this over. Because the rest of this fly, I'm going to tie on the top, the bottom side, which is the top side once this, this keels over. And the rest of this fly is deer hair. Is a strip, a little primo strip of chartreuse. And off camera, I'm going to cut myself a clump. I'm going to stack this to where the tips are right in to the point. Before I do that, I'm going to trim the butts a little bit because they're too long. So I put it right there and take one, two, hold your, your tips. Three, four, five, and then advance, push your clump back and advance your thread to the front of the fly. Next, I'm going to get a clump and I'm going to even the butts and cut the tips off because you don't need them. And I'm going to Pull this right up front, this one clump. Make one, two, three, four. And then push back. And find your hook eye. Do not want to uh, stack this real tight because you're not you not not wanting to float this fly. So now go in there and whip finish. 
And the rest of this is trimming. The last thing we want to do is to uh, take a bodkin and open up. Well, I'm going to cut the tail a little bit shorter. And then I'm going to come here with a bodkin and, and open up that mylar tubing. Fray it a little bit. There you go. Here's a little hint of some flash on the tail. So that's essentially the fly right there. See if I can get a clip on it. And it rides hook point up. Whoops. Add spotlight. Let me get rid of. There it is. Oh, that's nice. That is gorgeous, Evelyn. Thank you. And then wow. here's the other one. All right. Love it. Love it, Evelyn. Good job. Thank you. Well, it's time now for the weekly tip. We're going to continue our adventure with the inexpensive wide angle lens for the Macos camera. And I have an unexpected surprise tip that sort of crawled out of uh, one person's nightmare and became my nightmare as well. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's um, let's get back here and talk about uh, a, a lens that we have added to our arsenal. And I'll just slip over there. And you can see we've got several things laying there. I always have my static guard around to keep the static down. But this is the lens we're talking about. And it is a 3.5 millimeter to 8. Costs 20 bucks off of Amazon. And what I'm going to do is slip over here to the vise. Oh. And, uh, well, as you can see, I still have the old lens on the, on the camera. Well, rather than have you guys sat there watching me install this lens with my hands going over the and all this kind of stuff. Why don't you go to the other side camera there, Gretchen, and they can watch from without having my hands getting in their way. Great. I'm just going to unscrew this one. And my main purpose in getting this is I really wanted to be able to do, without moving my camera, to do a really wide shot for some of the stuff that I want to do. And one of the things that I want to do, and I haven't come up with a configuration to do it is to and take a weaving loom and put it in front of the camera so I can weave pots hackle. And with this, with this lens, I'm going to be able to do it. <clears throat> you, you can see now that that gives me a nice wide shot here. It's probably with my hands. Oh, they're a foot apart. That gives me more than ample space to put my weaving loom here and still be able to zoom in closer to work on the, the, the product there. Let me get a better focus there. There. To weave my hackle and all that stuff. And yet if we need to, we can come back and show the full thing and how you move your hands through the loom to get the hairs in place and all of that stuff. So I'm really looking forward to be able, being able to do that. I got this friend... You all have met him. His name is John Wright, and he's a part of Project Healing Waters in Omaha. He's the lead there in Omaha. Um, retired Air Force pilot who then opened a business and ran a IT business for years. And he's kind of a computer. Uh, he understands computers pretty well and, and cameras and so forth. And so between us, we've been coming up with more nightmares than you can possibly imagine. And he sent me an email recently saying, you know, you could put a Nikon lens on your Macos camera, that little camera that you just looked at a minute ago. In fact, that one right there, little guy, it's only about the size of a deck of cards. The lens itself is about three times the size of the camera. Anyway, and I said, oh, wow. So I looked it over and thought, well, what the heck, I'll give it a try. And I did. Here's uh, one of my old Nikon lenses. It's an all manual lens because first off, the Macos is an all manual um, camera. 
There, there are no automatic features on it at all. In fact, this, this lens is so old. See, I got it in, in the late 60s. Anyway, this is the ring. On this end, I'll show you over at the camera here in a minute. This is the ring that goes on the Makos, really small. You can see that there's a bit of difference in the size of this end as compared to this end where the lens goes, like that. Well, first off, it's just too darn heavy to put on to put on that camera, uh, quite frankly. The other problem I ran into, no matter which lens I used, when I installed it on the Makos, it magnified things so darn much that if I wanted to get the fly in the frame, I had to set the lens, set the camera on a tripod across the room. Just didn't work. Well, it turns out that John, in his wisdom, decided that he was going to get one for his Canon camera. And in fact, he did, and he got it earlier today. And let me find John and bring him into the picture here. And this is the picture he's getting with his, and I'll let John pick it up from here as far as distance and all that type of stuff. Thanks, Al. Yeah, he, Al's right. Um, I don't know, you, you, a lot of you probably had the same thing. You're, you're, everything is going nice, and you go to bed, and you, you toss and turn all night long because you got an idea that you just can't get out of your head. And this one hit me when, when Al talked about the, um, the ring he put on the, uh, the C100 lens to get up a little bit closer, a little bit nicer. And I said, well, why not use or, or find an adapter for a Canon or a, uh, an FTQL? So let me see something here. Uh, what I did is I went out and I bought a, uh, a converter for an FTQL Canon. And uh, the lens I use, you can see, I just want to show you here. Let me see. Can you send me back out of the way? Here's the camera right here. The lens. And here's my vice. There's about, about a three foot distance there, okay? Three and a half feet. <laughs> and here is the picture that lens is giving me. We're trying to adapt something made to cover about a three quarter inch by one inch area. And we're putting it on a camera that has a, a sensor that probably is an eighth of an inch square. So yeah, yeah, it, it they just weren't made for each other, and it's pretty obvious when you get it all together. Not impossible, and if you shoot over the shoulder like uh, Eric Austin does, uh, and you don't mind the camera being six foot away from you, it might be just the ticket for you. You never know. Yeah, you can see it here. This is this is my right shoulder. <laughs> there it is. Oh my. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, removing the spotlight from you. That's it for tonight, folks. Thanks for joining us. But for now, that's a wrap until next week.